a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. All right, Amazing Arizonans taking the show on the road, graciously giving us their studio. Michael Bidwill, the owner of or the president CEO of the Cardinals. Is that, is that the right term? Yes. Thanks. First of all, what a cool studio. This is great. This used to be the old mail room. Really? People used to send snail mail uh, to to the players, you know, fan mail yeah. and things like that. Uh, and so we had uh, mail slots for everybody. But when people stopped doing that and the email became yeah. prevalent in social media, we decided to uh, repurpose this room. And it's it's perfect. great. Yeah. It's a cool. So thanks for opening up. I sure appreciate thing. you doing this. Um, I want to talk about football. I want to talk about the Cardinals. But I really the whole purpose of this podcast, we call it Amazing Arizona. It's just great stories in Arizona. And uh, I've gotten to know you over the years and yep. done my homework. And the fact that you were a federal prosecutor, can we start there? What motiv- sure. what motivated you, not the family business, but to go into that direction? So uh, my father sort of motivated me to go into, to go to law school and then uh, third year of law school in Washington, D.C. Uh, my law school had an internship program at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. Um, and it was at a, you know, D.C. is a federal district, so there's no state yeah. prosecutor. The feds are the local prosecutor. Um, so I went to work for the U.S. Attorney's Office with uh, three of my classmates, all four of us got assigned to the homicide unit. And this is the time when Washington, D.C. was the murder capital of the world. And uh, boy, were my eyes open very quickly. And within a couple of weeks, I realized, wow, this this is something that I I feel really passionate about and uh, dove in. I didn't want to be a trial attorney, but that's what prosecutors are. And uh, sure enough, um, I really got excited about it, worked really hard. and, And I extended my internship from one semester to the whole third year and um, and then applied for the job out here in, in Phoenix, got it, uh, and was able to uh, spend six years there. And it was an incredible, incredible time. I got a chance to, you know, you get thrown from the uh, frying pan into the fire pretty quickly and uh, you learn. And it was just really exciting. I just think it's a great story because everybody would imagine it would be such an easy pipeline into the family business. What a great opportunity with the Cardinals, which eventually you did, but to serve your community that way, it's not an easy job. It's long hours. It's thankless. It can be dangerous, um, but it was fulfilling. It was very fulfilling. It was all those things, but it was it was something I really wanted to do. And I I wanted to go out and, um, you know, work hard and develop my own reputation and not just have dad give me a job or something like that. So that was my motivation at the time, probably a secondary motivation. The primary motivation was really diving in. And I love the work. It was great working with a lot of professionals in our office and on the in the defense bar and the, the judges. We have some of the best judges, federal judges in the United States here in Arizona, and it was just great to work in, in front of them as well. And I would imagine realizing that some of the cases you're working on are very impactful in Arizona, that you're you're trying cases with some pretty bad people and you want to make sure people are held accountable for the things they do. That's right. an that's a not just an important job, but something that's important to people that don't even know that it's going on. Yeah, so much of it. Um, um, you know, in Arizona, we have 22 Indian reservations. And so all those major felonies that happen on those Indian uh, communities come back to the feds. And so oftentimes it was not necessarily bad people doing bad things. It was uh, it, it was good people drinking too much or, you know, other sort of yeah. uh, issues and making some really poor decisions and, and letting emotion and things take over. But they still had to be held accountable. And the victims uh, deserve that. And so it was it was tough work. Um, but I, I loved it. I learned a lot and um, and really came to appreciate uh, our indigenous peoples here yeah. uh, throughout our state. And um, it, it, it was great. It was was just fabulous. I didn't know how it would prepare me for uh, work in the NFL, uh, but you know, uh, I think it, it really did help me prepare because you got to be able to think on your feet as a as a prosecutor and as a trial attorney. You've got to be stick to your message. Um, you got to follow the rules. Um, you, you've got to be civil. All those sorts of things, and we needed uh, so all those those things were were tremendous uh, things that I you know learned and did and and, and became very proficient at. 
Well, there's a there's a term in the law of being dispassionate that it's right. that's got to help you in your job of not it is an emotional game, but you've got to make business decisions sometimes. Right? Did it help you in that regard being able to make a decision that was your heart said one thing and maybe your your business sense tells you something different? Well, it, it Department of Justice is where, where where I worked as a federal prosecutor. You know, we our mantra was really our job was to do justice, not necessarily win the case. Sometimes, uh, you know, it was not about winning and getting a maximum sentence. It was more about, hey, we, we need to do what's right here. Mm-hmm. And if putting a victim through a trial might be too hard on that, then we need to find a, a solution that still holds the person accountable, but maybe um, is is a is a thoughtful um, solution under all the circumstances. See, that's, I, I just, uh, the, to hear these stories, this is exactly why we're doing these podcasts. Right. And So let's transition into your move sure. into the NFL. But I want to talk about the history of the franchise, because because you and I have talked about this before privately, and I think we've done it in some interviews. But the history of this franchise and your family, it means a lot to you. And and I think it's a great story. Can you give us some of the highlights of the franchise? Uh, didn't you have the first female owner? Uh, and some of those stories. I think some of those stories are fascinating. So the franchise is the oldest team in the National Football League. We date back to 1898. We started out on Morgan Street and Racine Boulevard in the southwest side of Chicago, wow. representing an Irish neighborhood. And we would play the German neighborhood and the Dutch neighborhood and the Polish neighborhood. And these guys would get together and start playing. Um, a couple of years later, we bought the used jerseys from the University of Chicago, who are still known as the University of Chicago Maroons. They were faded maroon. And Chris O'Brien, who was a player, coach, and then became owner, first owner of the of the club, uh, renamed the club that night. And he said, OK, uh, these jerseys, he held them up in front of the team. They're not red. They're not maroon. They're cardinal red. We're going to call ourselves the Cardinals from here forward. So we were actually named after the color, not the bird. Oh, wow. When the helmets went to plastic uh, from leather to plastic in 1960, about uh, a third of the way through the season, teams started painting logos. And so the Cardinals painted a logo uh, of a bird on the side of our, our helmet uh, at, at that time. But no, we were one of we are one of the founding two members still in the National Football League. The, the league was founded in 1920. The other founding member was the Decatur Staley's, who a year later changed their name to the Monsters of the Midway Chicago Bears when they were moved up wow. by George Hallis to, to uh, Chicago. He did it with a partner, uh, a guy named Dutch Sterneman. A number of years later, the country goes through the Great Depression, and um, he uh, Hallis is about to be out of the league because he's, he's behind and Sterneman has the money to take him out, but he went to a, his good friend and a big fan of uh, of the Bears, uh, and and asked him to uh, lend him money and then buy out Sterneman. And so that that fan was actually my grandfather Charles Bidwell. So we I have a picture of the 1932 championship Chicago Bears, two guys in suits. One is George Hallis, the other is Charles Bidwell, my grandfather. Wow. So. Um, a year or so later, um, my grandfather wanted to own his team. Uh, the Cardinals were in Chicago at the time, going through the same sort of financial struggles because of the Depression. And so my grandfather, with the help of my grandmother, purchased the team at a dinner party that uh, at one night that Hallis had set up with the owner of the Cardinals um, and purchased the team for $5,000, which was a lot of money in the uh, in the Great Depression. But still not a bad investment. It's a pretty good investment. Your family is a pretty good investment for the family. Right. So my grandfather had other businesses as well, but uh, he loved football. And... Um, and then to sort of fast forward a few years uh, af- after World War II, my grandfather passed away suddenly. He got sick. Uh, it was before penicillin was uh, oh. was discovered and invented and uh, used and, um, and passed away very suddenly in his early 50s. My grandmother in 1947 became the first female owner of an NFL team, and she ran it for the next 15 years. Wow. And so March was Women's uh, History Month. And so we've got a great YouTube for anybody that wants to hear a little bit about Violet Bidwell. It's about a six or seven minute YouTube on Violet. Um, And she was just an amazing woman. But she ran the team until 1962 when she passed. And then my uncle and father took over. Uh, My father became the sole owner. And then uh, a number of years ago, I became the controlling owner uh, of the team. 
I, uh, what I think is fascinating about the stories, and I've heard you tell them before, is that it means a lot to you to set those to set those records and to be the first ones to do that in your family. That the significance, of course, has to be winning on the field. But the franchise has done so much in the community and been trailblazers in so many different ways. Whether it's uh, gender or it's race, you've done so many things that other before other teams have done it. Yeah, it, I, th- I think it started with my my grandmother, you know, and I think and and my father as well. My grandmother was one of one for decades. She was the only woman owner for decades uh, in, until the 80s and 90s, around the 90s. Um, so uh, she stood for so much and uh, was just an amazing uh, leader. But my my father had a front row seat to see a, seeing a woman do a non-traditional woman's job, which was not only running the football team, but my, my grandfather's other businesses. And so I think that brought a lot to my father. Uh, and he was doing diversity uh, uh, before it was a, a cool thing to do, before it was corporately something that you wanted to do. But he started back in the 1970s, hired the first African-American um, woman in the front office of an NFL team, uh, the first black negotiator contract negotiator there were so many firsts we, we had the first with Denny Green and Rod Graves yeah the first uh, head coach GM uh, duo that were both black and so we we Dad always said he he didn't look at people's color. It was really about can they do the job? It's the right thing to do, and it's the right thing. And I think that's the I think that's what's so cool about the stories is that doing them um, because it's the right thing to do, not because you're being told it's the right thing to do. Knowing the people, knowing their qualifications, and saying they can do the job. I don't care what society's doing. This is the right move for us. I think that's a great story. Yeah. So let's talk about the league. Do you think your grandparents? uh, Do you think even your father would have? imagined that the league would become the juggernaut that it's become uh, i i think my father saw it you know continuing to to build momentum and, and but my grandfather didn't and you know he he you know tv was not a thing when he passed yeah. away in 1947 my grandmother was a part of negotiating the first nfl tv contract in 1959 and it was with cbs each team was going to get a million dollars a piece we were in chicago at the time the blackout rule was a blackout law in 1960 through the early 60s and 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 what that was going to cause is the bears and the cardinals were going to black each other out each weekend in chicago which was then the third largest television market in the country so it was determined that one of those teams needed to move it wasn't going to be the bears it was the cardinals we moved to sh- from chicago to st louis in 1960 so she was a part of uh, of that history as well and so it's it, there's some incredible uh stories but the juggernaut started in 1960 when uh and pro- not necessarily started but the business model started then because the teams determined they were all going to share the the revenue from that tv contract equally and it wasn't just going to be the big markets uh big markets like new york and uh like uh chicago when you're able to um attract some of the greatest athletes on the planet and i don't think anybody watching it on tv does nothing to when you're actually in a room with someone that plays in the nfl to be that big and to be that fast and to be that agile you are an elite athlete but and that that money allows you to attract those world-class athletes and i think that's why the product is loved all over the world the expansion over the years into europe and and the games in mexico city and uh, this expansion of american football i think has to do with you, you just can't take your eyes off where World class athletes. No, it's it, it and it, it's also a great game. I mean, it's, oh, it's an it's, amazing it, game. You know, you you think of it. it we we play when we're, uh, you know, youth, and then you go to high school, and you play high school, and then you play, and then college. I didn't play college, uh, and and it, and the funnel gets more and more narrow, and the athletes are just in, incredible. And to see them, and you've been down on our practice field sure. at training camp, and to see them running around and doing some of the amazing things that they can do with their bodies. You know, catching balls with one hand while they're being covered, running full speed. And, and and with a helmet on and lights in their uh, face, it's really incredible what they do. When you look at the direction of the Cardinals now and to get into some of the football stuff, I look at some of the things back here to get back to where you want to get back right. to. And you, it seems, I will tell you from a fan's perspective, everyone I'm talking to is so excited about the direction of the team. What is it in your mind that it's going to take to get to that level consistently again where the fans know that you've got a product they can be proud of and a team that they want to get behind? Yeah, it was a big setback when, when uh, Kyler got injured. Yeah. And you could see the difference once 
he came back in 2023, how much better the team got and won a lot of games and cl- games that even when we were out of the playoff race, you know, we we uh, this team still was fighting and wanted to win and did win and some and pretty tough games on the road mm-hmm. in uh, hostile situations. But I think in year two with uh, Jonathan Gannon and Monty Austin Fort, they've done a great job. Monty with the talent, and we we just finished with um, with free agency. And we've got five starters that, you know, he is now brought to the team. He was smart about how he managed our salary cap situation. We're getting ready for the draft now. Uh, The draft capital that he was able to pick up last year and the trades that he did. uh, I really feel confident that he's going to select the right players and that we're going to be able to hit the ground running and come out of the shoots much stronger than people are expecting. Um, And I'm going to I'm sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth, but it just reminded me that uh, the way you and I I met was well, I would be emceeing events and you would be there speaking at charity events not just writing checks but you would show up and you would be there to speak on behalf of the team and and we got to talking about those things can you talk about Cardinals charities sure can you talk about why that's so important to you because I don't know that the community understands the depth of what you do so I think it's 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 our commitment to the community that's not only Cardinals charities where we give away millions of dollars a year we we try to number one focus on uh, charities in Arizona that benefit women, children, and minorities. Northern Arizona, Central Arizona, Southern Arizona, and we make we make an impact, and uh, we feel good about that. But we also give away to charities, um, you know, helmets, uh, autographed items, jerseys, things like that that they can auction off and raise even more money. Then I think the important things that we do are. Um, I think, you know, when our players show up and participate, uh, when we're able to, you know, use our influence for, for good things. You know, now we've got flag football that is Arizona is only one of eight states in the United States that has um, women's uh, flag football. So now women can participate in flag football is a high school sport now for women. And um, and so we, we are participating with them. So it's not, it's not just, you know, the things that we're doing from a charitable standpoint. Point, but also the civic standpoint. Mike, I, I I don't know if everybody understands the what's going on with the USS Arizona today. Yeah. But the USS Arizona was sunk in 1941 on December 7th, and uh, about a thousand sailors lost their lives. And um, the Navy's never um, commissioned a new U- USS Arizona, but there's a new uh, uh, nuclear uh, submarine that's being. Built. I had the captain on my show. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Great. great. It, was, it was a great interview. Young yeah. guy looks even younger than he is. It, it, but what an amazing story. It's a, it's amazing, but, it, you know, what's great is is we're helping with that. Um, so, and that's I think so that's, cool. I think it's important that we do that. You know about the Civics Matters Arizona program that we do with high school students from Title I schools, underprivileged kids. Most of these kids have never been on an airplane, but we load up the team airplane after a competition. You know, our state doesn't, it didn't have a civics competition. competition. It had a spelling bee, a state statewide spelling bee. So with others, we put together a um, a civics competition and the grand prize is those students get that get selected and winning their the the contest uh, get a four day, three night, fully paid uh, trip to Washington, D.C. with the Close Up Foundation and they fly on the team's plane. So each year we bring about 275 kids back, all high school level, and it's fantastic. And we always ask before the trip, how many kids have been on an airplane? The vast majority have never been on an airplane. And so and they get to experience and learn in D.C., visiting these uh, monuments and museums, hearing from our U.S. senators and our congressional delegation. Mm-hmm. This year, Governor Hobbs is going to be leading it again with, um, uh, who's a Democrat, with a Republican, Juan Siscomani, yeah. a congressman from, from Tucson. And so you just think about civics is important to everybody, and we really want to try to re you know, it's not taught in our schools anymore, but we want to, with our civics program, really try to get it going again. And, you know, um, I, I still am the guy, and I you lived there for a while, so maybe not, but for me, I still, I still tear up 
when I get to the National Mall, I intentionally go into DC on the Metro yep. and get off at the National Mall station so I can okay. ride that escalator up and right. get that view when you step outside. Right. And it still brings me to tears and going to Lincoln Memorial and hearing people whisper when they talk and looking at that. And and so all of those things are so meaningful, but I have multiple opportunities to go and do that. I would imagine for these kids, for the first time to lay eyes on the things they've only seen in textbooks has to be life changing. And, and they're blown away in that being able to experience it and to walk the mall and see all those different uh, buildings, see the Capitol and the National uh, Monument and the Lincoln Memorial at the end, the Roosevelt Memorial, the MLK Memorial, all of those things. And then uh, to sit on the steps and hear from one of our U.S. senators or congressmen um, and to you know be able to ask them questions. I mean, it's just a once in a lifetime experience. And w- w- it, it is not a cushy trip because what they do is w- they, the Close Up Foundation gives these kids homework and they have to learn to debate each other and they get up and deliberate and they learn about the legislative process. So at night when they go back, they're not going back to watch movies at the hotel. They're down in the uh, meeting rooms and they're in small groups debating each other and they give them different sides of tough topics like you know we're going to talk about gun control yeah. these aren't easy topics and, and they'll they'll make them switch sides so they teach them how to debate uh it's it's really a cool cool program and i'm glad you're telling these stories because we talk about wins and losses we talk about economic impact right. but there's no way you can replace the impact of some of these stories and, when, and going back to the player participation um I, we volunteer quite often at saint vincent de paul and some other yep. places and there was a one holiday i can't remember if it was christmas or thanksgiving we were volunteering with a big group and um, Larry Fitzgerald showed up with the group and what was fascinating was everybody with Larry worked there wasn't people weren't just there to take pictures Mm -hmm. they went to work and they were cooking food and they were serving food and they were cleaning tables and Larry was taking pictures and signing autographs but the fact that that iconic player walked into that building it wasn't just the people that were being fed that day everybody in that building got to see somebody that truly was giving back and loves the community. Yeah, no, and it's, uh, Larry just leads the way in so many different ways. I was with him uh, last Thanksgiving uh, at St. Vincent de Paul. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah, and he, he brings his sons along, and they're working. And uh, and and so... That was the best part, was yeah. everybody went to work. They yeah. weren't just there to stand around and be seen. They went right. to work. It was great. And Christmas with Kelvin Beecham, one of our, mm-hmm. another one of our Walter Payton Man of the Year uh, award winners, uh, at Christmas Eve, and, and, and he brought his kids down. So it's just great. I love it when our players go out there and are, are, you know, and so anytime they're going and I hear about it and I'm available to go, I go. And it's the atmosphere because where I work now over at Bonneville at KTAR, they foster that same thing in the, in the building. It is someone right. they not just encourage it, but they help in making sure it happens and they get involved. And I would imagine you doing that and not just saying to people you're allowed to do it, but encouraging it to yeah. happen has to be yeah. a big part of it. I think it's huge. Uh, I think it's it's so important because so many people are looking at, at, at their sports teams and, and, and the people that they really, uh, you know, uh, appreciate on the field and see on TV and the uh, all that and my view is it's it's up to us to use that all for good how can we build uh, and make this community better yeah and I think I've seen I've witnessed that for years with you and I'm glad other Thanks. people are getting to see it when you look at I want to ask about success because you look in the last few years and the Suns have made a big strong comeback mm-hmm. here in town and the D-backs in the run to the World mm-hmm. Series and I know that when you made the run to the to the Super Bowl and when you had those teams that the other sports teams were happy for you and encouraging and complimentary. What does that do? Do you keep in touch with the owners and the people in the other organizations? Are you as happy for them and congratulatory when they have this kind of success? Yeah, no, Matt Nishby and I are text back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I see uh, Ken from time to time, Ken Kendrick with yeah. the Diamondbacks. And so it's it's always great. And, and of course, Derek Hall. And, and so I think it's great when, you know, when the uh, tide comes in, all the boats in the harbor fly yeah. higher. And so it's always good for sports. But I will tell you, I'm, I'm anxious to get us back there. And I know Monty and JG are. And we're really aligned on our desire to get this thing uh, and get it right this year. And, and it's it's exciting. And what's nice to see, I've been here almost 30 years now in Arizona. And to see the the growth of sports here is becoming this becoming a sports town, a Cardinals town. And, right. and using the analogy of it used to be when you go to a game, you'd maybe see kids in Cardinals jerseys. But the parents were wearing jerseys of the other team or teams that were 
they came from. Right. And now you see entire families are dressed in the Cardinals red. And it's good to see that, that, we're, that we're starting to see all of that happen. Exactly. And, and, and that is one of the things that we've, on the business side, Mike, we've really focused on this. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about JG and Monty and what they've done on the, on the football side. On the business side, Jeremy Walls, our chief operating officer, has completely revamped our sales and marketing model. It was old school. We needed it revamped. He did a great job. And we are focused on putting Cardinals fans in that stadium and try to eliminate. We can't, we're not going to be able to eliminate all the visiting team fans, but we want to have that home field advantage. And, you know, last month we rolled out a bunch of new premium seating products that we're super excited about, and they're going like hotcakes. The casitas, right? Casitas. We have field suites, field boxes, uh, field seats. Uh, we've got uh, the Morgan Athletic Club, which is named after the Morgan Athletic Club okay. from back in 1898. Wow. Uh, we're renovating uh, part of the stadium. The construction's under the way now where those people will have access to that. It's going to be themed after a 1920s style uh, uh, Paris uh, supper club and, nice. and, and, and dinner club. And so it's going to be uh, it's going to be a really cool vibe there. And, um, you know, many of those products are already sold out, but uh, but people are Peter, people are pretty fired up about it. But I think you look at this stadium, we finished 18 seasons there and uh, with the final four and, you know, we'll have other events coming up uh, that we'll be out bidding for. We've got to keep it fresh. And we've every year we've been investing money in, into that stadium to make it super fan friendly and make it an exciting place. Well, the other thing you do that I think is really exciting that I love is the lawn where people are out there pre-gaming. On right. the, it is that atmosphere just to walk around there and see people with tents set up and playing games and throwing the ball and that pre-game there. But the family atmosphere. Atmosphere. I think it's one of the coolest atmospheres there are available to people. It's just a cool way to start the day. Yeah, no, it is. It is amazing. And that was one of the things, you know, during COVID, we built the, the big fan pavilion and beer garden. And then following uh, the, the passage of uh, legalized sports betting here in Arizona, we built uh, the BetMGM Sportsbook out on the Great Lawn. So we're doing not just during games, but now even around Final Four, a lot of activity. Sure. Super Bowl last year. A lot of activity out there. You know, we just it's all becomes part of the 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 um, the the pregame activities. But then on non event days, we're doing other things out there where we're doing festivals, uh, cultural festivals. We're doing uh, private corporate events. We're doing a lot of things. It's really a, uh, it's it's kind of cool to see how much we're using this this facility now. It's a great segue because um, I've always been I've always argued in favor of these partnerships where stadiums are built and things of that nature. And I remember before the stadium was built, and there was not much of a controversy, but there was a lot of conversation. And I remember you talking about the investment and the value to the community. And just in the, off the top of my head, WrestleMania, um, uh, SmackDown was just here, right. Taylor Swift, Metallica, right. um, Final Four, National Championship, Fiesta Bowl, Super Bowl. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things in those events. But these are things that not just drive revenue, but when you've got cameras from the world, from all over the world right. showing this valley and the beautiful uh, availability we have. It, it just shows off that what this valley has to offer. And you can't buy that anywhere. No, I mean, the the exposure, that the, the especially the sporting events, because they're televised and the ones with an international audience, the exposure that the valley and the tourism industry get is uh, you can't buy it. It's just uh, it, the, as the camera scenes go in and out uh, to, to the game and they fade away to commercial break and they're showing uh, the beautiful vistas and views around uh, Arizona and the valley. That is so important for us. But I think what we've done smartly, you know, including w with with the Final Four and last year with the Super Bowl, um, we, we get that economic tsunami that comes through. Sure. And we have a huge economic impact on the, you know, the weeks around the event. But we, we've been working, and I started with Governor Ducey a number of years ago and now working with Governor Hobbs to put together these visiting CEO programs. So we use these these events to bring in CEOs that are looking to move their their businesses to the mountain west and we're it's it's like corporate speed dating we're, sure we're trying to recruit these guys to come out and uh, and so we've been really successful there so we have the economic tsunami of 
all the mm-hmm. the event. We've got the exposure, but then we've got this long tail of it. It's, it's like a river of economic benefits that come when they land their businesses there and when they start hiring local Arizonans with these high paying jobs with benefits. And I think there's there's a that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is because we you have the to have the mindset to say we want to we want to make this even bigger and better. It's not just going to be the Super Bowl. It's not just going to be the final four. It's going to be the what are the residual effects? How can we tell other people as a business person? How can you say to other business leaders? There's a reason why we're in Arizona and there's a reason why we love Arizona. Right. And it and, it, and a lot of it is just, you know, that we let the elected officials have the conversations, and, you know, that they need to have around in the, in the government officials, not just the elected officials about, you know, the the, the structure of whatever sure. arrangement they're going to have. And what we try to do and the, and the business leaders that participate in this is really try to talk to them about the benefits of doing business here, the, what it's like to live here. Because, you know, as you can imagine, they're moving their families here. They're moving their employees' families here. They want to understand. And we can we can provide that context. We can provide that background. Um, I want to touch on something. And I don't know how much you want to talk about this. Sure. But the. The Cardinals and what they do, uh, first responders, military, after 9-11, your con- close connection with your family um, with 9-11, but also Pat Tillman and what mm-hmm. happened with the legacy there and the memory of Pat Tillman and what an impact his sacrifice had on the organization. I mean, as a community, we all felt it. I think the entire NFL and country did. But there was a an impact within the organization, and you pay close attention, at least I see it when I go to games. Right to honor the men and women that serve. And I, I think that is something that needs to be recognized because it's it, it makes me cry every time you do right. it. And I hope it does everybody else, too. Right. Well, it's it's something that we're honored to do. And you know, April 2024 is the 20-year anniversary of Pat's death. He died in April of 2004. And, um, you know, I know we're going we're gonna to mark that day, but I also know that Pat Tillman Foundation is going to be doing some things. And uh, uh, so we're excited about uh, what... Uh, uh, the Tillman Foundation is doing to carry on Pat's legacy and continue to support it to this day. Uh, they participated in last year's Super Bowl and and, um, and got a lot of exposure because they were part of the coin toss yeah. in last year's Super Bowl. So it's just huge. But for me, I think it's um, uh, our uh, women and men of the military, women and men of first responders, um, they put their lives on the line and uh, do it selflessly. And uh, we see it today. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that's important to me, it was important to my father. It was important to my grandfather. Can I tell you a story about absolutely the first uh, person? It, it it wasn't Pat is the answer. Do you know who the first person was to leave the Cardinals and um, join the U.S. Army? No. This guy named Mario Tonelli, whose nickname was Mats Tonelli. Okay. And Mats Tonelli was from Chicago. He went to University of Notre Dame. My grandfather um, drafted him in uh, 1940, and he played for the Cardinals in 1940. But at the end of the season, he chose, because the country was uh, uh, going to war, um, uh, to, to join the, the U.S. Uh, military. And so he was the U.S. Army, and he was assigned to the Pacific Theater. And he was one of about 10,000 uh, American and Filipino uh, military members that were captured on the Bataan Peninsula. Oh, my gosh. And he, a 215-pound football player, w- w- survived the, the, the death march, the Bataan death march, survived the death ships, and then survived two separate um, uh, prisoner of war camps, served about three years, three and a half years in prisoner of war camp. Um, but the story is, which is really interesting, in 1937, USC was playing Notre Dame, and they still play today, you know. And so... Um, uh, the game was in uh, in Notre Dame. It was at, uh, in in Indiana, and uh, Tonelli at the in the fourth quarter. It's a it's a close game. Tonelli scores the winning touchdown in 1937 to beat USC, and it was with just a few minutes left. But he breaks through and he wins it. Um, 
and he, he uh, ha, ha, for for all of his effort and everything else like that, he got a class ring uh, when he graduated and inscribed and everything else. And it was really important to him because he got a golden class yeah. ring. Um, he had that with him on the Bataan Death March. At the beginning of the Death March, the Japanese soldiers were bayoneting uh, the other soldiers that they were they were stealing all their jewelry, their watches, their wallets, everything. And at one point early on. Tonelli has, he, he gives him everything except for the ring because it was so important to him. Um, a Japanese soldier came, puts the bayonet to his throat, and the guys around him say, give him the ring because he's going to kill you and take the ring off here in just a minute or so. So he turns over the ring and, um, so again, goes on uh, this terrible, awful baton death mar march where they were they were bayoneting and killing uh, uh, our men mm -hmm. and the Filipino soldiers for just stepping out of line. They got no water, no food. It, it lasted for days. And um, later at, at, at the prisoner of war camp, uh, he was approached by a, um, an, a, a Japanese officer. And he, the Japanese officer said to him in perfect English, he said, I know who you are. You're Mats Tonelli. I was in school at USC and went to Notre Dame to watch that game. And I remember watching you score in 1937. He pulled the ring out of his pocket and gave it back to him. He said, I know one of my men stole this from you. I want you to have it back and you hide it. And he said that day I met Mott's back in the late 19, 1990s. And he said I, he knew at that point I was going to live. And so he hid the uh, the ring in a in a in a soap container underneath his barracks, and um, and then when he was eventually released, he was able to uh, recover that. But he knew at that moment he was going to live. When he got back, he he was met in the hospital because he was so weak. He was only about 120 pounds. My grandfather Charles Bidwell went to go visit him in the hospital and signed him to a contract. Um, and my dad remembers him sitting on the bench that season when he came back, not strong enough to play. But my grandfather wanted to make sure he had a job and that he could he could get himself going again. And uh, and that's what Mott's did. It's an amazing story. I can't believe I've never heard you tell that story. That is an amazing story. And and it should be a movie. And hopefully we're going to make it into it a movie. It should be. Someday. I mean, that's 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 Rudy type stuff as far as yes. the, compelling to the American public, but with such deeper meaning. I mean, right. what a what a story. So the connection for the Cardinals has been to the community, but your connection with Pat Tillman, but also for the legacy the military, of your family yeah. to the military. How does that play out in your mind when you watch? Because I've I've seen members of the military sing the national anthem, the recognition of troops in the stands. Right. I've seen teams repel from the from oh, the yeah. rafters. I've yeah. seen a lot of different ways to show them off. Who go? Who does that? I mean, who for you puts that on the field? We we've got a great game day entertainment team, and they put all that together, and then work with the PJs. It was the Air Force uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pair jumpers that, that that did that. They're just awesome. And um, but we have other other branches that are doing flyovers and doing other yeah. things. Uh, we've had the Marines, we've had the Air Force, of course, uh, we've had uh, the Navy. Uh, we have all the branches of the U.S. Army. So um, it it's it's. Uh, We've got a great team that puts all that together, and, and we make a big deal, and we do it with our partners. Raytheon Missile Systems from Tucson is always a big participating partner in our Salute to Service Day every year, and it's 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 cool to see. Yeah, it is. It's amazing to see, it, it, and it's it's uh, it does your heart good to see everybody when you recognize a member of the military in the crowd during a game when that person right. gets recognized to see everybody. Uh, whoever's in this, whatever, whoever you're cheering for, stop everything they're doing, stand right. and applaud. It, it it renews your faith and it makes you believe right. people still can get past any divide they have and in unison say that is something we should all recognize. It's cool because you know visiting team fans they are up on their feet and when it, we're, we travel on the road we and we other teams do it too. Uh, you see everybody in our our suite standing and, and applauding because it it brings people together and it's it's the right thing to do. You know what's interesting too about I, I've said I'm going to the games. At, at the stadium, uh, the atmosphere is so conducive to family and to fun. There's a lot of passionate fans, and but I don't see you don't see the vitriol you see in other places. And I'm not saying negative things about other places. Right. I'm saying here, um, I've been in the games where 
fans of the other team are very close to you and everybody's jawing and having a fun time. But when the game's over, there's kind of a high five and it's just it makes it a great experience. Is that something that you guys work on to make sure that it's that atmosphere? We do, but it's our fans doing it. But I, I'd say probably the biggest part is are all the members of the, the stadium team, our security, our ushers, um, uh, you know, the Cardinals employees sure. that are out there, the uniform law enforcement from many different um, municipalities and from our state DPS. Uh, we've got so many great members of the team that all wear maybe a different uniform, different color shirt or a different color, you know, from red, you know, might be the blue T-shirt folks sure. or the uniformed officers. But we all have a, a common interest, which is make sure no matter who you're cheering for and what the outcome of the game is, everybody has a safe and secure uh, in, uh, time. Now, we, we, of course, all the local Arizona people want to see the visiting team fans at the end of the game go home very sad yeah. that their team lost. Angry. But we want them to feel like, <laughs> I, okay, I felt safe in this stadium yeah. and and I, I chair the NFL's security committee and so among the things that we we oversee is security inside and fan behavior and so we we continue to want to make it a safer safer a safer place in all of our venues around the United States not just the venues but it's really important you saw what happened in Kansas City it's going to be NFL events too so we're we're raising the game in terms of security sure. we want people to feel very safe at all of those Let's uh, as far as on field stuff. I know you're not going to tell me what you're going to do with the fourth pick. I'm right. not even going to try to ask. Right. But right. but the philosophy of building this franchise of of getting back to where you know you can go with the team you have. What's the philosophy going into the draft? What are you talking about? What are you thinking about? What's the next step for this team? Well, getting good players who right. will perform at a high level for a long, long time and be great, great teammates and great members of the community and rep- represent our values and, and become part of the leadership of this organization. But before. is it, I guess, I mean, see, I'm trying to get you to say something you're not going to say. I right. want to know, is it about getting that superstar player necessarily, or is it about getting quality, really good players and building a team with really, you know, as opposed to having the superstar of having a great complimentary team around them. Well, if we if we stay at four and pick at four, we're going to get a superstar, and I think yeah. it, depending on where, they're going to be great players that become superstars, not just in the first round, but you know, look at Buda Baker. We oh my we, gosh, third round, you know, Pat Tillman, seventh round, yeah, you know, a lot of different players get their players every year that are undrafted. Go back, Ron Wolfley, yeah, Ron Wolfley, you know, and then you look at uh, um, you know Tom Brady, fifth round, you know, a lot of so it doesn't it, it it does matter where they're drafted, but I I think what our philosophy is going to be great great players that are also good people and that are going to fit into what JG and Monty are looking for in terms of the kind of player and teammate that we'll have here at the team. And you can see it as a fan. I'm sure inside the organization you see it even bigger. But there is a difference in the culture what the fans are seeing when that team's on the field. And there was a unity in that team this year that seemed so compelling to watch them fight and as, as cliche as this is to fight to that very last whistle for each other was something that uh, win or lose right. you got to respect it and love it i i think you know that's where i you know tip of the hat again to jonathan gannon jg has done such a great job getting the players to buy into his vision and it's about team first and you second and they work really hard knowing hey, I've got to do my homework at night to get ready for tomorrow's practice. And that is six days a week, and then day seven is the game. And it's about taking care of their bodies, making sure they understand things, and it, and they're not, they're, they're, they know this playbook so well, they don't have to think, then react. They're just reacting because they've showed up, the practice has instilled what they think they're going to see, and they're able to react quickly. And then they play for each other, and that's what that team in 2023 did. And I'm super excited about the talent that we'll bring in and building upon all the great players. That But it's quality people as well. We've had right. the conversation about quality people. If you look at the sports franchises in Arizona, we've been blessed with great leadership. Larry Fitzgerald is on that right. Mount Rushmore. You've got right. Shane Doan. You've right. got players across the league and every franchise has got it. And I think that that kind of quality leadership and quality human being plays a big role in it. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. My brother, sure. you know the story, my brother, I lost my my brother in Iraq. Right. So five years after my brother was killed, I got a phone call from a guy who I didn't know in my hometown. And he said, I was a freshman when your brother was a senior. My brother was the quarterback of the high school football team. Wow. 
When Tom was killed, I met the guys he served with at his funeral. And they said, hey, Tom always looked out for us. And they told us a story of what happened that night. And they said he was looking out for us, even though he was wounded, taking out the initial attacker. So he always looked out for us. Five years later, this guy Bruce calls me and says, I was a freshman when Tom was the senior. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody picked on the freshman. He said, but you know, Tom always looked out for us. And that was 1987. And so in 2000, uh, would have been five years ago, 2009 or 2008, they renamed our high school football field after my brother. The same things that the soldiers in Iraq said about my brother, uh, an 18 year old, they said about an 18 year old kid on a football field in Southwest Florida. I I don't know that you can, you can't teach that kind of character in people. And when you have that kind of leadership in your locker room, it transcends everything else. I mean, it's got to be something that's so important to have those kind of people. Right. It sets the tone. And when you, when you're just looking at talent only and you're not, you know, somebody may be able to run faster, jump high. Or you know, uh, catch the ball with one finger, or whatever. But they're 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 not about the team, and they're not about team first and putting them, themselves second, which is what it sounds like Tom yeah. exactly did. Yeah, is a is a high school student, and then as a uh, a soldier on the battlefield. Um, that's that's the kind of player we're looking for. Is is that? Uh, and so I think you know that's that's a key thing. But they still have to be able to play football really well. So who are the, who is the generation? Give me a player or two now. I, I talk about Larry because that's you know what right. everybody knows who Larry right. Fitzgerald is, right. and I think he's the quintessential model of that. Right. But who are the guys that are doing that for the Cardinals right now? Well, I think Buda Baker. You know, you look at uh, Trey McBride, Kyler Murray. Um, you know, uh, I think Paris Johnson came in and did a great job. That we've got uh, you know a lot of players around around the team that that are contributing some of them veterans uh that are that are contributing guys that we've signed last year uh that that came in and contributed right away and so what we're that's that's going to be the sixty four thousand dollar question here is you know monty's got to go find those guys who can immediately come in and help out um like trey did and, and paris johnson um i think he started more uh plays than anybody on the offensive line last year so um i think that it's going to be important for us to have players that are contributing right away. And Paris is somebody who is immediately bought in to the message and to the culture. And he's he's a culture carrier. Uh, it's going to be cool to see how he uh, comes from a rookie. He's a veteran now because yeah. we're, we're in, in, in his second season. And it's, it's, it's great because we're here at the training facility. I'll see these guys in the weight room, and uh, it, it's great to see all the, the the young guys and the older guys coming in here and working out every day. Well, as a fan, it's exciting. I love seeing how excited you are about this season coming up. But as someone that knows you a little bit, mm-hmm. I'm excited for you. I like to see that you're, you've you got that, that. I can see looking at you how excited right. you are for what the fans are going to see and the league is going to see from the Cardinals this year. I, uh, Kyler is in here every day. Everybody needs to understand that he's working his rear end off, um, and he is he is in here for hours every day in, in the weight room and rehabbing. And he's working closely with Buddy Morris, our, our strength and conditioning coach, that really focuses on the rehab guys. And Buddy and and everybody understands that that ACL injury is not really a one year injury. That second year, the second off season, is a huge time for him. So I. Th- I expect him to be even in better shape, and uh, I see all the torture that, that Buddy puts him through. But Kyler's doing a great job as well. I can't thank you enough. I know you're on a clock. I know you've got a it's lot to do, but to carve time out for this podcast, yeah. the idea is to tell stories of people in Arizona, of great just stories. And I think yours is one of the best. I love well, talking you. to you about these thank things you, and learning it. And thanks for sharing it with the audience, because I know they're going to sure. be excited about it, too. My pleasure. Thanks, Thank man. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. That's it. Another edition.